Before we set up the lighting in the scene, we need to address something that we missed in the previous tutorial, and that is to prepare the water of these rice fields. So I'm going to select one, and open the material presets, and I'm going to assign the water color material to it. Now, as you can see, even though they were all sharing the same material, the watercolor material was not loaded with it. And that is because these elements were all sharing the Lambert 1 material, which is Maya's default material that is applied everywhere on any geometry or NURBS that you create. Now, the tool recognized this and simply did not change every element in the scene that has the Lambert 1 material assigned with the watercolor preset. So the tool is powerful enough to know that, but that means that we'll have to assign this watercolor material that we created onto each element manually. And we do that through the hypershade. So once we're here, we select the material, we give it a more descriptive name, water score SFX. Oh, didn't work. Underscore SFX. And now that we have that, uh, so there's a lot of materials here from previous artists, but we're just interested in water SFX material. So we go back to our scene and we can middle mouse drag or click and drag into the elements that we want with this material. Go and this one as well, and the lower one as well. So there we have it. Something that you might have noticed is that even though we have a light here, we don't have any shadows being casted on the ground. And we need to fix that, basically. That's not the normal behavior. So in order to see the effect of lighting on the material the best is to come here and change the shade factor to 1. This means that it's going to be an entirely diffuse behavior. And once we have that, we can come to the light and customize the shadows. So we're using depth match shadows. I'm going to put this to 4006. And you still don't see anything here, which is kind of odd. So let's take a look at its attributes. As you can see here, this element is very far away from the origin. And we're using a normal light, uh, directional light. So if we come here and freeze these transformations, there we have the cast shadow appearing suddenly. Now you might have noticed that even though we put a very high resolution, we get a very poor resolution being casted on the object. And that again has to do with where the scene is uh, compared to the origin. Now, since a directional light doesn't really have a position, the shadow map of the directional light is always going to be fixed at the origin. If we happen to be 10,000 Maya units away from the origin, it's going to be a high resolution at this distance is still going to be present itself basically as as low resolution because it's covering the entire field from 0 to 10,000 with a shadow map and the limited resolution that we have is distributed across that so don't worry if you don't understand that it just basically means that if you're working if your scene is working close to the origin, you can use directional lights without any issues, but because we're so far away from the origin, we will have to use a different type of lighting, one that has a starting position. 
So as you can see here, um, we can thankfully change the type of light and we're going to change it to a spotlight. And now you will see right away that the shadow resolution has improved considerably. So now we need to treat this spotlight in a way like a directional light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this quite far away. And I'm going to light up the entire scene with it. Just this way to it's my spotlight. If I middle mouse drag, then you can see. Let me. You can see what you're actually lighting with it, which is quite handy. Uh, but there seems to be some some clipping happening. Let's put this to 1000. Let's make this 100. So we're not really going to see anything before that. So if we put the spotlight far away, it's going to act like a directional light. But then our the difference is that when we select, no, we're selecting the camera, when we select the spotlight, the shadow map resolution gets distributed along what the spotlight is lighting up so it's not bound anymore by the origin like the directional line so we have the entire resolution to create nice shadows for our scene here so with that set up i'm gonna move here and now we have the shadow there but as you can see there, we have also a lot of this very small little noise, and that's not really normal. And we can fix that as well here in the, let's call this main light, or key light. This one. It's, it's giving the main lighting. So we modify this with a bias here. Let's add 0.00. .00. As you can see, we got rid of that noise. And what the bias is, it moves the shadow map a little bit, the depth of the shadow map, so that when the differences are too small, they don't create this kind of uh, pattern anymore. So now that we have that, we have set up the beginning of, of our lighting, but it's not really acting upon the remaining elements. And normally that's not the case, but in this case, we also have a group that is very far away from the origin. So as you can see here, these are quite nice, uh, nicely frozen, the, their transformations, but this group isn't. So we go to modify, freeze transformations, and then suddenly we have shadows for all the remaining elements. So I think we're good to go here. Now let's just match the lighting, the key light, to the lighting that we have uh, as reference. See, in our reference, our light is throwing much longer shadows than our current setup is, as you can see here. So we can change that as well. Let us go to our key light. So we should create this all from the side. Like this, let's try this out. And now we have a much better recreation of the original, the, the sizing of the shadows, basically. As you can see here, let's take a look through the actual shot cam. There we go. 
Okay, so now that our initial lighting is set up, we need to basically tweak all of the materials to make it look like this in this style. 